Very interesting. Uh, to introduce our speaker tonight, Brad Zinda. Uh, his intern has worked with uh, Gene Jacobs for many, many years. Brad, take it over. All right. Thanks, Kent. So I'm very honored to be able to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Gene Jacobs. Gene is not a new face to us here for our Audubon programs. He's presented a couple times in the past. Uh, but just a little background for you guys. Um, Gene is the raptor biologist and owner of Raptor Services out of Stevens Point here. He does research and consultant work. Um, he's been studying raptors <coughs> since 1973, and over that time he's banded over 17,000 raptors in the state. Uh, some other things that he's involved with is uh, leading a raptor field techniques workshop, which is accredited through UWSP. He does solid owl banding from his Linwood Springs Research Station home, just here in Stevens Point, and does public programs throughout that season. He's authored or co-authored 14 papers in uh, peer-reviewed journals, and recently, he's well, he's been studying the red-shouldered hawk for 48 years with his brother John, um, and they've recently started a new research uh, project with them using solar powered GPS transmitters to track the birds and their movements and that's what Gene will be talking with us tonight on and I've had the privilege of working with Gene over the last five years on all of his other projects including this project tonight so I'm excited for you guys to learn a little bit more about the phantoms of the forest so please help me welcome Gene Well, thank you, and I just wanted to say thank you to Sue for inviting me to come speak here tonight. It's always a privilege and an enjoyable time for me to share with you some of the experiences we've had during while we're studying raptors. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Aldo Leopold uh, Society for their um, funding for the project. They've been the first; they were the first organization to make a donation and help get us off the ground floor. And so I just wanted to thank them, you guys as well, for that. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, we, we called the title Tracking the Phantoms or Phantoms of the Forest. The reason we kind of gave that name to the Red Shouldered Hawk was because um, excluding this uh, courtship period of time, the rest of the years, or the rest of the time, they're, they're very secretive, they're difficult to find sometimes, and sometimes people don't even know they're in their area. They, some, I've had them nesting in town on occasion, and sometimes they're nesting in a tree right in someone's backyard and didn't even know they were there. So that's why we call them phantoms of the forest. I'll give you a little overview of what we're gonna do tonight. A little bit of, got a couple slides and information. Brad kind of covered it, so I'll probably breeze over a lot of that uh, about some of the projects I've been involved with. Uh, I got a two minute slideshow that we're gonna see in a couple minutes. Uh, and it's all the different, um, it's a class I teach, it's a rap called the Raptor Workshop. And uh, it's, it's geared to be a hands-on project or, or course where the students get uh, a chance to do the things that I'm doing, not just to watch me do them. So that can involve taking birds out of nets, climbing trees, uh, working with transmitters, um, doing video surveillance at nest sites, um, all kinds of, those are the kind of uh, topics you'll see. And you'll see in that little slideshow I have um, what, what it, the course is about. Um, we get people from all over the country, some even from Mexico or Canada, who come for the workshop. So it's, it's always fun to have such a variety of people come to take the class. We'll also go through briefly a little bit about the natural history about the red shoulder hawk. I just wondered if we could see a show of hands uh, of everyone who's seen a red shoulder hawk. Good, 
That's good. That's good. They, we have them in pretty good uh, densities here in nesting because we have habitat that's what they're looking for. They're looking for usually river bottom floodplain forests or any type of mature stand of forest where it's primarily forested, it can't be open country, real open country, they don't um, use that type of habitat much. Um, so, let's see, what else are we gonna go through? Oh, the objectives of our study. Um, we got results from our first year. We had put on uh, five transmitters last year, two here in Stevens Point area, and three in the Green Bay area. And then I'll take some questions. And you all get a chance to see Sassy, our great horned owl. We'll bring her out. For you. I, I always make sure I have her up here last because if I did her first, then I wouldn't have anyone to talk to. <laughs> She's the main focus. So, like Brad says, I work as a raptor consultant. Usually, it's conducting surveys for endangered or threatened raptors. So bald eagles, peregrine falcons, red-shouldered hawk, those are some of the more likely ones that I would do work on. Even goshawk, sometimes they have, in a way they want some studies done. And then these are part of the permitting process that the utility companies, usually it's uh, pipeline, the trans uh, transmission line, <coughs> uh, the DOT, um, to work, uh, if they want to do any work on bridges or expansion. So that's what they, uh, have me do. Um, I mentioned this about the class. It's uh, involved in sometimes climbing the trees because it's important for us to usually, for a nesting study, to get up to the nest, to ban the chicks, uh, get a count on the number of chicks, and a lot of other things we can learn from climbing up there. The students learn how to take the birds out of nets and um, how to handle these birds like the red-tailed hawk. You don't need gloves. You just have to do what I tell you. <laughs> now this morning we caught four. Um, it was, it was, this is was October session class and I teach the class twice a year, once in June for a week and a week in October. And we were banding red-tailed hawks at the banding station and this is the students who came um, to my class. We get all kinds of people from all kinds of career oppor opportunities too. Some are retired people who just want to get out there and do something fun. Uh, some some of them are undergrads, some are graduate students. So it, it's uh, a lot of people of different ages will take the class. Okay. Brad, did Brad, do you have the volume? Okay, well, the, the sound isn't um, working for some reason. It just has some music in the background. Um, but these are the different uh, birds. This is the red-shouldered hawk, um, snowy owls. I do some climbing and repelling. So all the students get a chance to do that if they want. They don't have to. Yeah, there you were. We had some, some years, we were fortunate enough to have a nest of short-eared owls to visit one year, so we caught the mail and banded the chicks. Yeah, that was the point of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, for a little bird, those kestrels sure like to bite. <laughs> we use, uh, instead of the old days, they used to use a, a mirror on, mounted on a telescoping pole to count the eggs in the nest. Now we have a little camera mounted on them, and it transmits down to a little pocket TV to count the, the eggs.
We also have a section where we uh, teach the students how to work with some of the forestry equipment, measuring things like a, a DBH tape, um, different uh, hang altimeter, a couple of the pieces of the equipment we go through. <laughs> Drawing blood, um, it's, a, it's an exercise that a lot of students are interested in doing because um, with the, the DNA interactions we can do, we can, so it has a lot of opportunities to know how to do blood sampling. This is that we're continuing with the red shoulder hawk part of the uh, uh, program. But um, the red shoulder is, a, is listed as a threatened species in Wisconsin. And so um, that's kind of uh, important. They're, they're always, the DNR is trying to look at ways of how to manage for them, how, what kind of uh, selection or what kind of habitat do they use most frequently? How big a home range do they have or for, for breeding? How big an area do they need to have protected? So that's some of the benefits. Are in this study that we're doing with this telemetry equipment, you'll be able to understand a little bit about what's the value and the purpose of doing this. There's a logging. Um, so I do some work for Wood County Foresters. They're um, constantly in that county. They have a lot of um, forested the areas that are in a logging um, management practice across the, you know, I think it's thousands and thousands of acres. And so they run into red shoulder hawks a lot of times and they want to know, well, how much can we cut and not disturb them? How close can we get? And a lot of those questions are difficult to answer uh, because a lot of times the birds react different to different individuals sometimes act different. We have some birds nesting right in town, and so then someone could say, well, they're not afraid of people. That we, we mow our lawn all day and they never fly away. Well, that's fine because they're accustomed to that. But if we went to a nest that was in the middle of a forest, and all of a sudden come along one day and just start with a chainsaw and start cutting trees all around that tree, um, that would be very stressful for the birds. They may abandon. But um, so it's listed as a threatened species, and they're <coughs> currently thinking of uh, reevaluating that listing. And so they wanted to know some of this information that we can help them with with the transmitters. And we're in negotiations with them right now to help fund this project that we're doing with the transmitters. Uh, red shoulders are kind of easy. Um, if you can see them clearly, but most of the time you don't get a good look at them, but uh, a couple of field marks that are handy to know about is their, their tail has white and black bands on it, uh, the adult plumage does, and they also have those white and black markings on the wings. And so um, if you see a bird with any kind of white tail band, especially if you see two or more, then it should be a red-shouldered hawk. Broadwing has a white tail band, but usually they only have one that's visible. And 
to feel this dissipation. I have the. Uh, this is the time of year they a lot of the birds have just started coming back. I don't think all of them are back yet on territory, but many of them um, have started showing up in the last week. And this is the call of the red-shouldered hawk. So if you hear it, uh, I'll move down from you guys. So I'll blast you up. <laughs> but, um, so if you hear this call, then it, you know that's time to call me. Uh, I'd be interested if you if you think you have uh, a bird's nesting on your property or on, on someone's property that you think would allow permission to go in there and look for them. But this is what they sound like. you that will help rule out those, those uh, blue jay calls is the blue jays usually just do a shorter number that was a series the red shoulder does a series of five to seven of those calls and, do, and the blue jay will do one and then he'll do one and he won't do that air 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 for six seven series um, another thing is he's a lot soft that, you know, so sometimes it's kind of hard to tell is the bird farther away because the red shoulder a lot of times I can hear them over a quarter mile away but then they sound me pretty soft and so then is that, a, is that a blue jay who's close or is it a red shoulder who's soft because <laughs> it's so far so So we have two study areas where we're doing this. I mentioned earlier, Stevens Point area and the Nicolay National Forest, Schwamigan up in the northeastern Wisconsin, north of Green Bay. My brother's territory is pretty big. Um, so, but it's up right just north of that green dot. Uh, red shoulders, like uh, mature stands of forest, usually associated with some kind of water. Uh, it can be flooded out uh, areas, it can be along a stream. So water is an important component. Um, and because whatever harbors frogs, frogs are their number one uh, food, food item. So they do usually, um, sometimes they'll travel half a mile to get to some water, to get to some areas that are good hunting for, for um, frogs and so you just don't really you can't rule out some areas just because there's no there's no water within a quarter mile and say well then they're not here but they could be uh, we've had them nesting right like i mentioned in town this house here was right above the guy's driveway up where that red arrow or the white arrow is that's the nest right here that white pine yeah mm -hmm. I've noticed that they use white pines in the rural sites as well, but they seem to, whenever we get into a lot of residential areas, they seem to use a lot of white pine for nesting. And I just got a lot of no, but it makes sense. They use it because they're usually nesting, laying eggs, and sitting on eggs for a month before the trees leaf out. So if you go to a deciduous stand of trees, uh, that nest is obvious and the bird knows that they're conspicuous so they're very bashful and they don't they don't have the cover that they they would have if it was a pine tree so uh, that's my hunch on why they seem to nest real frequently in town in pine trees now this net they usually nest anywhere from 40 to 60 feet up in a tree and this nest, or this tree has pretty, pretty good lean to it, and I was a little nervous about going up there, so I asked Kent if he'd go up there and hold it. <laughs> so Kent was up there holding the tree, so let's keep us safe to go up there and do our data. <laughs> uh, but the nest is built primarily of sticks, 
some leaves, but mostly it's a stick nest. Usually it's pretty large. You know, it looks almost the size of a garbage can cover. A little bit smaller, maybe. Um, so that's the kind of trees we have to climb. Sometimes, and sometimes if it's in a red oak like this, then we don't use the climbing, the traditional climbing spikes. We use ropes, and I got this super big slingshot that shoots up a big bean bag up with a line on it over a branch above the nest so that I can climb up the rope and um, hang just above the nest so I can ban the chicks. Here's a view from a trail cam of a nest. Um, this one's in an oak tree and they typically lay three to four eggs, rarely five. And the females on there incubating. The male does share in the incubation, but um, it does about 20 to 30 percent of the incubation during daylight hours. She does all the incubation at night. Okay, our objectives of our study was to determine the breeding home range size and use of the red shoulder hawk, um, nest site, and mate fidelity in subsequent years to try and figure out if this thing's coming back all the time or not. Uh, our early information from our banding uh, results suggest that the males uh, do not tend to move. We only had one male move over several years. Um, and the, uh, the females, though, they seem to move a little bit. They'll move to, we've had them move um, five or six times, and a lot of times it's um, just nearby to an adjacent territory. And we've had her sometimes, she was gone for a year, she was down a mile from the first nest, and then the next year she came back to her old male and paired up with him again. Uh, I guess something was a little rough with the couple. They just uh, <laughs> thought they could find better stuff somewhere else. <laughs> um, with these transmitters, um, and uh, coming up with the picture of the transmitters, uh, we're going to be able to do determine migration timing and routes uh, because these transmitters <coughs> Um, record all this information. It takes a GPS reading. It can take elevation reading at the same time, and even speed, how fast the bird's flying, if he's flying when the recording, when the data was recorded. Um, so these are important uh, things that we can detect with this new transmitter system. Uh, when, and then we can get the winter range size down wherever they might, wherever they're um, uh, wintering. So, so the, the transmitter, I brought one in tonight. This is the transmitter. It's got a solar panel on the top. And it weighs about, this one weighs about 13, 12, at the, 12 and a half grams, which is... Um, quarter of a pound is about 90, you know, 100 and some grams. So this is like a tenth of a um, How big does a bird have to be? Um, the, the red shoulder is about crow size. So it weighs about 500 to 700 grams. And we can put on transmitters that weigh 3% or less of the bird. Uh, banding lab has done extensive uh, testing on what's what's um, appropriate that does not interfere with the bird from um, its daily activities. And this has a solar panel here which charge, recharges the battery inside. And as long as that has pretty good sunlight getting to it, it will recharge and recharge and recharge. And then it has a GPS in here and we can set the settings every, we want it to read every hour, every half hour, or every 10 minutes. We can set it to almost any time frame we want. The only controlling thing is that it needs to get enough sunlight to use, to uh, 
to be able to operate like that for any length of time. So, um, yeah. So these are these are these are kind of expensive. Uh, this technology just came out a few years ago. Before they made bigger ones that we were using on golden eagles and snowy owls, but that was too heavy to put on a spread shoulder hawk. So we had to wait until they finally came out with technology that brings it down in size. Yeah? How does that stay on the bird? Okay, um, I have some, some uh, it, it's on a, a thin, well, it's about a quarter inch wide, uh, Teflon ribbon it's called. It's very pliable but very strong. And uh, it's on a little backpack harness that fits on the back. And the little loop that goes through here, that goes around, down his breast, and then goes up um, behind his wings, and then attaches back up here. So you don't stick that No, this is the antenna to send the signal. <laughs> 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 So with the way this works, and then what it does is once the, the data builds up in there, because if it's taking, let's say, 10 readings a day, uh, we don't usually have it take any at night, but um, it can build up, uh, if it doesn't connect right away, it can st it stores and stores all those locations until it, it connects to either a cell phone, because it can transmit the, the information either to a cell phone or in this case, this one is not cell phone capable. I have to go out there in the woods and be within an eighth of a mile of the bird, and then it'll download all the data to my little receiver. Can you, in, in, with your equipment, do you know that the feed is coming in? Yeah. Otherwise, you might walk away and be out. <laughs> right. Yeah, we can, um, and the, uh, uh, and if, if we don't have a connection, and we don't, let's say we don't go out, well, we don't go out there every day, we wait till sometimes a week. There's a week's worth of data stored on here, and then we go out there, and when it connects, it's just going to down, download it all. Now, when it goes to Florida, when it goes down south out of the state, um, and you have to go out of the state, Arkansas, Tennessee, Illinois, even Wisconsin, some hunter here, um, it, st it stores the data, and it just and if we didn't get in contact with it for years, it'll go up to like eight years worth of data. 30,000 locations. So it's really valuable. So then it, when he goes down south, and uh, this one doesn't have the cell phone option, um, it's just storing it, storing it, storing it. And then when he comes back up, then we go out there and provide it. The, soul, the sun's still getting a lot of sun to keep charging it. All these things that have conditions, um, then we'll be able to get all that data. Um, now the, the, the issues we ran into this year, or last year was our first year, and we were the first ones to ever use this technology on red shoulder box. And, and after discussing it with uh, colleagues of mine who've done it on other woodland raptors, given that these woodland raptors sit in the shade, and the red-tailed hawk and the harrier, they sit in the sun, all the studies on harriers and red tails uh, did pretty good. <laughs> but when they go sit in the shade, it doesn't work quite so well. I guess it can work, but the other problem we had is his feathers were covering the transmit over the panel, shade on top of shade. And so, um, but that, that's why this one's elevated above his feather line now, and it has a little canopy like hold the feathers down uh, and it's got this little point on the on the top to to def deflect the feathers from side to side rather than just flat. Do you have recovery information on there like if the hawk is killed or something? Is that ever sent back to you? Um, the, the information will be sent and it, but it doesn't have like return to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some of, one guy did put out a little label on these with his name and phone number. If anyone gets it, it's not a bad idea. So. <laughs> or are they left on it? 
Um, as long as they're functioning, we'll leave them on. Um, but when when the and I don't know if it can go for years as long as it keeps getting recharged. Um, Eric. Yeah. Um, do you think this does this turn off after so many minutes? I was babbling so long without switching. Did it turn off? It's <laughs> always a possibility. We'll deal with it if that happens. What, what did happen? <laughs> oh, it's working. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's it's sitting there. That was right after we put it on, and it looked like well, it's going to get all the sun it needs, but he once he got. Or was it, it was female? Once she got preening and you know flipping her feathers around, um, we had we got data on all of them for portions of the summer, but not the whole year like we wanted. And so, but I'm really hopeful and also pretty confident that this new style is going to address those issues. Yeah. Did you design it? No. Now the, the manufacturer came up with this plan. What information do you get with it? Well, it takes a GPS coordinate reading. So we have a real, real accurate measure of where it is, and we can do even forest, micro forest habitat. Uh, so we can tell, was he in the forest? Is he on, in the wetland part of the forest? Or was he in the dry part? Was he in the pine stand? And then so that can help in an analysis of what type of Habitat they prefer over what's available, and you get the date or the time or whatever. The date, the time, the temperature, uh, the elevation. Usually, the birds up a few, you know, like ten meters, five, eight to ten meters is the elevation for him. Uh, but if he gets up on these some of these nice days and does a lot of circling, he gets up really high. Then um, we could see a thousand feet or something. Okay, so that's the transmitter on the bird. Now these are the first readings from the, the uh, transmitter that the, this Audubon Society has donated towards the transmitter of this bird. So I wanted to make sure I brought in some information on 005. <laughs> we have a 007 <laughs> too. Um, so the bird started, uh, this was um, after only a couple of days of recording. And down here is where the bird is. The screen is the nest, the dot. And then all these blue are the points. And all the yellow lines are arrows connecting to the next location. So you can tell direction and how big an area. And this is a small area. It was around 10 acres of land where she stayed the first few days. How often were those blue dots? We, were, we had these set at um, eight, eight, eight a day. Take eight readings in a day. But we, when we started losing volts, it also records the volts. It sends us back what's the volt of the battery, and it's down into the hundredths of a volt. We can see what it's trending. And we started to lose ground day after day after day it'll hold probably a, a good three weeks of being not charged much. It was always getting some charge sometimes, but it wasn't enough to make up for what we were spending on the readings. But then after this, with this female here, it lasted all the way past August 20th because uh, this was her new territory. So she expanded quite a bit later in the summer when she had big chicks, she doesn't have to sit and guard the chicks like she did way back here. <coughs> Her main, main goal to stay by the chicks when they're a couple weeks old or less is to protect them from other predators. So if she, if she sees a red-tailed hawk come flying through the area, she's going to be on them. She's going to come and swoop and hit them or swoop at them and chase them away because the red tail would go up there and eat the chicks. Um, so then, but once the chicks have fledged, then she doesn't have to stay so close to the nest. And so that's why she expands, whoops, that's why she expands her, uh, her home range size as the season progresses. 
And then I have a, another slide here. This is, oh, not there. There. This is all the readings from her. And um, she expanded further out here, and she doesn't spend much time near the nest. Not after this late in the year, she's spending a lot of time hunting over here, all over. And um, her area is up to now 163 acres. And we tested this on the other female that we did in um, the Green Bay area, and it was very similar. Uh, the first, first uh, this one we had a bigger sample size of 10 days. The first 10 days, she was just in this small little area here. And then on the second 10 days, or uh, from the 25th of July 7th, then she started branching way out too, way out of these points. Out here, and this this is the old area that she was in before. What are they primarily feeding on? Um, they're pretty opportunistic, so they'll feed on. Well, the from our food habit study, they they fed the most heavily on amphibians. Um, now this is by occurrence, so um, a salamander doesn't have much mass to really add towards the. Um, the amount of food they're getting. So one chipmunk might equal 10 salamanders. But not taking that into account, just the, um, so amphibians are the number one thing. Small mammals come in too, like mice and shrews and moles. And then reptiles, snakes primarily, sometimes a turtle um, comes in uh, third. And then birds and things very small, um, insects, earthworms, fish, all are in part of their diet, but uh, primarily uh, the amphibians. Frogs, the number one. Who are they food for? You mentioned the red-tailed hawk predates uh, the nests. I assume <coughs> other things maybe. But yeah, the red tail, anything bigger than them. And they're medium size, the Cooper's hawk, Nah, he's smaller and by mass, if, if, if she was away from the nest and the chicks were relatively small still, maybe five days old, <coughs> and the female wasn't paying attention, uh, Cooper's hawk might be able to sneak in there, grab a chick, and take off. But for the most part, it's, it's bigger raptors and rat mammals, bigger mammals. Raccoons are probably, and fisher are some of the, we don't have a lot of fisher here, but my brother has quite a bit up in Shumanberg and Nicolay area, so he has some of the nests, and the fishers are so powerful and so fast that they get up and they kill the adult female on the nest. I had some of that happen here in Stevens Point, too. Uh, very agile. I had saw a friend of mine had a goshawk camera up, a trail camera up in the nest where the goshawk was nesting and the goshawks the female is as big as a red tail and he had it up and it was at night but so I had night vision going on it and the I was to my surprise when the when the fishers first showed up in the in the view of the camera the goshawk was awake I thought there were all these raptors, diurnal raptors, were pretty vulnerable to the fisher because they can't see them coming, they're not paying attention, and they're sleeping. And, but for, in that case, at least, the fisher was, was or the goshawk was awake and was on guard, ready to fight. And the uh, fisher came and charged, and they did a rumble tumble in the nest, and then the fisher jumped off to the branch on the side, and the goshawk was kind of scared of this whole thing, so she took off, and the fisher looked like he was going to leave if she would have just stayed still. But she, she left, and then the fisher turns around, and he comes and eats the eggs. So, okay, now back to this bird is the one that we had just were watching, um, the female up here. And she had, um, <coughs> uh, let me just see. yeah, these, these, these green dots, these are her 
her readings finally uh, fizzled out in July sometime. And, but uh, in the fall before she left her area, she gave us three more readings through the cell phone because had, she had a cell phone transmitter. And so we got three more from her before she left. So they really were, her late fall area is a little bit distant from where the nest was. We don't have many readings to really say, but none of these three really fall into her. Oh, this one might fall into her window of her home range size, but it might. Um, so it's uh, kind of hard to say where, where she was, but she was still very close to her uh, territory. Even November 2nd was the last reading. And so there, these adults are probably migrating later in November. So once it quits transmitting, then do you remove the backpack from them? Or? Yeah, if it if it fails, and I don't know, I would say the first thing that's going to fail over time, like years, a couple years, is going to be the battery. It's like your cell phone. It works fine for a year or two. It's recharged every night. This gets recharged every day. Um, I think that's the thing that kind of fizzles out. Not that it would just, you know, it might still work pretty good because it's charging all the time if it gets sun. But I, that I think, but I know they've had them on for three, four years in some birds, five years. Um, but if, if ours fails or we not, if we don't, we don't have it's not actively working. And actually, all the birds we put transmitters on last year, those five, two here and three in Green Bay. We're going to try and catch them and take off the old ones to replace them with new ones that are working hopefully much better. Uh, if we, and if we, uh, and then when, and let's say we're done with the study, then we'll go out and catch the, all the birds and take the transmitters off. <laughs> so, bat birds. Um, Fall data was right there, so this is the area she was, was nesting. This is up by Malton, Wisconsin, um, north of Green Bay, about 60 miles. And she checked in just about a week or two ago, which was really exciting for us, because we didn't hear anything from her all fall, because I think because of the feathers were covering. And, but apparently she's gotten and the daylight was short in the winter. Now the days are getting longer. So, but it, for whatever reason, she started. She checked in again way down here, and she was um, way down here. This is uh, Green Bay right there, Appleton there, and this was along ten uh, by Wyoiga or Walpaca. So that's where where she's she was a couple weeks ago, and she would, had been there for over a month. So, and a lot of our birds are back on territory now. I think that that was where she wintered. We're not, she could have wintered further south because we, we don't have any data on December or January. We got February 9th, which is, was pretty much winter. Um, so <laughs> the snow depth kept getting worse and worse. So I, I think that was really, and that was very surprising to us that she was still in the state. And only 78 miles from here, from where she summered to where she wintered, I was really surprised. We had uh, one or two other um, red shoulders winter here near their nesting territory. I had one in Stevens Point uh, years ago that was within a mile of her breeding spot. But, okay, and then this one was a, a male, 006. And we got a lot of good data from him. And you can just look at all these data points, all those blue dots. Uh, so that was one of our best. This one, this male's transmitter was working really good. It was just so surprising how well that one worked because it was for a month. The first first month we didn't lose any bolts. It got, he got, uh, my brother got data on it till um, September. So, so now our plans for this year 
are to deploy, deploy eight more of these loggers or transmitters, uh, four in each study area. Uh, we're going to retrap the adults and replace their and upgrade their transmitter to a new one uh, using this new transmitter design. And then we're going to continue raising funds. Um, I can show you here. Here's another picture of the the hawk with the transmitter on his back. And then this one here, oh, he just fluffed a few feathers and all of a sudden it, it's getting buried. Oh, oh, yeah. So, um, this we had this problem a little bit with the snowy owl transmitters that I was working with for years. And, but we, we thought a little different. We thought, well, yeah, you expect a snowy owl. He's got so many feathers. Of course you're going to run into that. We didn't... Uh, and, think, and, it, and they, the guys with Harriers, they didn't have problems with this low profile <coughs> transmitter. But Harriers, and then another time, when the bird is flying, then it flattens its feathers out and makes themselves streamlined. And then, then the transmitter is completely in the sun, unless it should be pretty much completely in the sun, unless it gets kind of hung up on the top of it and then it doesn't come down on the old ones. But uh, whenever the snowy owl, there's some pictures of the snowy owls, and that's when they looked at the picture, they could see the transmitter because they had that little bump sticking out. Mm -hmm. But yet when it was sitting, you couldn't see the feathers because he puffs them off. Okay, so these are our supporters. Um, as you can see, primarily a lot of them are Audubon chapters, um, and but we do have some. Some people have um, donated money towards one transmitter. I've had several people. Uh, usually, it's a couple, and um, then of course, when someone makes that kind of contribution, then it's up to me to get get them interested to coming out and seeing it happen, and they be part of it, hold the bird, uh, take some pictures, uh, release the bird, and uh, have it a fun time. So, um, Brad, did you want to get, I think we're ready for questions and you can get, I have a little couple minute, um, I don't know if this will work since the other one didn't, but I think it will. Um, GoPro, I took a GoPro <coughs> camera when I got to the top just under the nest where the chicks hadn't seen me yet. So I got strapped into the tree so I could get my GoPro out and I put it on a selfie stick and I stayed below the nest and I just kind of like a periscope <coughs> and put it out so that we could see into the nest and so people could kind of see what I see whenever I climb up the tree and I pop my head over the nest. Um, that's what you'll see here. <coughs> It's not on a full screen. You need to expand it out. Oh. And I started. <coughs> oh, the other way. I got a shirt. The other way. The other way. <laughs> <laughs> Here's me getting it ready to bring it up over the nest.
There's four of them up there, and uh, he's going to wake up his sibling, and then there she's going to join in with his uh, vocalizations. These are about three weeks old. Yeah. Yeah. Jane, have you ever been injured up there? Um, I got hit a few times. That wasn't bad. I never, um, never really, I got all kinds of safety equipment on, you know, like where, like you could see I had a climbing helmet on, I wear goggles, um, and a female a couple times hit me uh, that, at this nest. She was terrible, that's why I made sure to wear a helmet here. Um, but she she comes through really fast, you don't know if she's coming, all of a sudden it's just like someone slammed you on the back of the head or the shoulder. I, it just doesn't, it seems like it It can't be that powerful, it's not a big that big of a hawk. But it's, uh, if you run tight into that, you could lose your balance and fall or something like that. Um, but overall, um, I haven't really had any issues. Uh, I've probably been hit over the years six or seven times. It's not it's not that common, especially if you have a crowd of people down below the nest that were to, 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 to ban the birds or to take measurements or draw blood or whatever we're doing. And so then when there's a crowd of two or three or four, they're, they're a little more bashful than than when you're by yourself. So, so any other questions? Yeah. How much does one of those transmitters cost? They cost the ones that the, that we put on the snowy owls were running three grand. Oh. Now this one is about fifteen hundred. So this one's I thought when I when I, we were looking at prices for these. Um, and when I saw they got it this light and it was only 1500 that sounds like a bargain when you hear it. Yeah, three grand. And three grand is actually a lot more than it was five to ten years ago. It was five to ten thousand. Wow. How do you go about checking an adult? Um, we've had them uh, very good success using, I hate to say it too loud, she might hear me, Sassy. <laughs> We're using Sassy the Great Horned Owl. And what we do is we put up a mist net, which is about as long as this room, and it's a net on two poles, and kind of like a badminton net, but a lot higher. And then when the hawk swoops at the owl, he just swoops at it to scare it. Then it flies into our net. So you're setting up the owl. Yeah, we put the owl <laughs> near, the, near the nest tree. Like here, if we'd have it down in the person's backyard. And so then when the parents come back with food to feed the chicks, all of a sudden they see the owl down there. Well, that's the last thing they want sitting close to their nest. So they start screaming, and then and then they hit the net. So does that terrify Sassy? Well, she's the big, it, 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 I, don't, I, I think she's cautious. I wouldn't say terrifying, uh, but I think she, but she's, a lot bigger. I guess it's like if you were in a position and you and you thought someone smaller than you and less powerful than you, you don't really give them that serious uh, consideration. You know, maybe like a big kid on the, the bully on the block and he goes into the kindergarten stand with all these little kids and he doesn't care if they slap him on the shoulder or something so much. And then he can't get, really see that um, the idea that a hawk doesn't want to try and fight with them. It'll lose every time. It's, it's he wants to come in for a sneak attack and give him a slap or just fly over his head and that scares them. You know, they, they're jolting, you know, they're kind of, um, it's over really fast. Yeah. Gene, could you I repeat see. the questions that you have? Oh, so yes. The, yeah. I'll, I'll speak up. Uh, I, uh, you say uh, frogs in the summertime, okay. Uh, in the wintertime, I've seen so few small mammals. 
<laughs> what do they uh, feed on in the winter time? Um, the diet shifts a little bit, well, quite a bit to small mammals. It's mice is the big thing, but uh, especially in town, if they're, we've had some that wintered in town, their their diet consists of more birds, like morning doves. Uh, that's a nice size bird and nice prey item for them. Last them a couple of days. Um, but for the most part, that's probably why they migrate south of here, is to get down where there's more food. Yeah. Do you ban these chicks or just the adult birds? Yeah. You yeah, so asked if we ban the chicks. We ban both the, the chicks and the adults. Um, right now, we're not planning to put any transmitters on. We couldn't put them on these chicks. They're too little yet. We have to wait till they're just about ready to fly out of the nest. And then um, <coughs> we're going to wait for another year or two to see, make sure that these are working exactly how we want them. Yeah? How many years are you planning to do the research? Um, three to seven years. <coughs> kind of a big window there. <laughs> um, and yeah. Uh, kind of how it goes, but and we need a, a good enough sample size. Twenty. Our plan is to have in three to four years to have 25 of these deployed, and that's good. But 35 is better <laughs> for for statistical analysis. Uh, we need that kind of those kind of sample um, to really be able to state state uh, check for significance. And, yeah. Jean, how far south do they migrate? Um, and also, what is their life expectancy? Okay, she asked, how far do, south do they migrate and the life expectancy of the red shoulder hawk? Um, that, that was one of the shortest distances, 76 miles that we're aware of, but we all, the data we have right now is from our band returns, and band returns come in pretty slow. Most people don't find a dead hawk. If they do, they don't see the bands on there. So we don't get very many recoveries. And so that's the main reason why we're doing this study is to determine how far they do migrate. Mm -hmm. And um, what was your second question? Life expectancy. Oh, life expectancy. That we got a better grip on. The life expectancy is well, I can give you a more on longevity. The longest they've been known to live in the wild is 21 years. I had, I caught one of our, one of the birds we caught just last year, of the adults, was banded. And I thought, oh, this is good. So I went and checked on where it was banded. Yeah, it was one of my birds, and I banded it as a nestling. Uh, three miles away, uh, 12 years ago. So that bird, I know for sure, it's 12 years old, and he used to live over there where he grew up, and now he's an adult with his own family three miles away. Would you say, if it's the further south, you were known for sure when went, like, to um, or Florida? It, yeah, it was probably about a thousand miles, and it was um, Arkansas and um, Kentucky area. Is that us? Or you're trying to figure just, it out? Just shut it off, Brad. <laughs> yes, your question? If the battery goes dead, do you lose your data? No, it stays saved on the chip. Okay. And then the next time it gets sunlight and starts recharging the battery, then, can, and then when it's turned off, it's not using up more juice. So then it, it goes through, we've had it happen on some of these where we lost it for a day or two, then it went on again. Um, so that's, um, we don't lose it, it's safe. Yeah. Do you have problems with raccoons following scent up into the nest trees or do you do anything to prevent that? Um, we, when we, we try to keep our distance during the whole time, like from when we find the nest, I don't walk up to the base of the tree. We stay, because we, we stay back, and then all I do is get a GPS reading on the, the, the nest, and then I leave. Sometimes I'll put on a little flagging, 
so I can find it because when the trees leaf out, it's near impossible to find. Uh, even with a GPS, sometimes you just don't can't see it. Um, and then on, a, on some other occasions, I won't say we do it all the time. Sometimes when we walk in, then as we walk out, we'll sprinkle um, mothballs oh. to kind of camouflage or you know it, it cancels out our scent. Um, yeah. What is the long-term benefit of this type of a study? Um, she asked, what's the long-term benefit of this study? Well, it helps um, a lot of it, some of the basic stuff like this, the size of their territory, um, how far they migrate, if, if, if things, and sometimes we don't always know what the benefit is because it's like kind of going to the doctor. You don't know and then all of a sudden, they detect something and they know they have a baseline because they took your blood pressure for months and then all of a sudden, you know, they can tell something's different. Uh, so we don't always know, but I can tell you that some of the basic things that they're uh, concerned about is habitat. Where, where, those habit where the habitat's good for red-shouldered hawks uh, and it's not too far north, we get up into upper Michigan and numbers of red-shoulders are dropping off. It's, it's too far out of the range, so, but um, it allows them to identify what type of habitat, how, how big a home range do they have, so they know, well, we can't allow logging in within so many feet of the nest since his nest is this many acres. Um, it'll help um, um, trying to think. Oh, and, and, and the same thing with the, the logging practices, like when they, when they go through and do a cut, then we can track the bird. Oh, he didn't come back. He is over there uh, three miles away. And we, whereas with, without the transmitters, we, couldn't, we didn't know if he's not there. We didn't know he's not there. We, all we know is we can't find him. And, but that doesn't mean he's not there. But with the transmitter, it tells us where he is. So, and that's very helpful to see really directly. If he was nesting here fine. We went through and did our cut of 60% uh, clearing and left 40% of the trees left <coughs> thinning. And all of a sudden, all the woods is still here, but boy, you can, it's almost sunny here. It's so open. And then, well, then all these bigger predators can come in, like the red tailed hawk. The great horn. They, they're not, um, by opening the canopy creates an issue for the red tail. He can come into the forest a lot easier. Uh, not to say he couldn't fly in otherwise, but it's more complicated for him to, to maneuver through all this structure. Kind of like getting a 747 to try and land, you know, mm -hmm. in a little narrow strip. Uh, so, <clears throat> any other questions? Yeah. We live about a mile north of St. Catherine Church, and we had a red shoulder hawk nest up there that failed. Yeah. Can you tell the nest has failed from the ground without why is he going on? <coughs> yeah. And what do you, how do you determine that? Do you want to guess? No. Um, What's that? Easy? Yes. That's, that's usually our best clue is when, I, when, we, when we go to check the nest, we can't always see up there. Now, if the chicks are big, but sometimes they sit down, but when they stand up, then they're real visible. So it's a little hard to tell, but um, the way we can tell that eggs have hatched is we just go look at the base of the nest tree underneath it. And if there's no white speckling, then the chicks either didn't hatch yet or they just hatched that day or something like that. Once all of a sudden you, you go up to the nest, you see splatter, splatter, splatter all around. You've got 10 or 20 of these white splatters below the tree. Then it's most likely there is a, a some chicks up there. The parents very rarely will do that, defecate at the nest. They fly away. So um, that's one of the ways. And it's just sitting sometimes. Sometimes you see the speckling, but that doesn't mean, that means they were chicks. But maybe last night, along came Mr. Great Horned Owl and took away with the chicken. 
and you think, oh, it's got to be chicks. There's, there's whitewash here. I'm going to climb. So you go up there all ready to band. And go ahead. What the heck happened? <laughs> and then a lot of times, I don't know what happened, but I can do is speculate. Unless I find the dead chick. Or if I find, sometimes when a raccoon kills the, the chick, he has it in his mouth and he's backing down the trunk of the tree and the feathers are getting dragged against the bark and you'll find little poops of white down on the trunk of the tree or some feathers that he pulled out. Then you know, it was some type of mammal that climbed up there. Maybe it was a bobcat. <laughs> Gene, thank you so much. Excellent program. If you have further questions, you can come up and talk to Gene uh, independently. Just want to announce that next month's uh, program, the 17th of April, is going to be about um, Lyme disease and particularly all the tick-borne diseases in Wisconsin.